the champions have been decided. But as we all know, it's not that simple booking an appointment with the Don, the Biggin, the heavyweight champions of the region. You'd think for someone who potentially holds the title of world's strongest, they wouldn't be insecure enough to set up four consecutive bouncers just to get to your room. But here we are. The champions don't like trick-or-treaters ringing the doorbell every two minutes outside of their golden penthouses. They were sick of getting Oxfam asking for donations. So there was only one one option to construct the Elite Four, the embodiment of, all right, you loosen them up for me, boys. The game was rigged from the start. My theory is they go to the cinema business structure. Their profit is all made from 12 pound hot dogs and tango ice blasts. It's all a market employed by the poker markets. So you spread that wallet for them full restores. There has to be an Elite Four though. The culmination of your journey surely must be the ultimate challenge. And if that's what you're belly aching for, you can look no further than the Doom Tower! As featured in this video's sponsor, Rage Shadow Legends! The free-to-play mobile fantasy turn-based RPG with so many ways to experiment methods of taking down hordes of enemies and lethal boss fights. The layers just keep getting even more stacked for the depth and strategy of the turn-based combat. To conquer the Doom Tower, you're gonna need your very own army of champions to whip this giant prison back into shape. And to help you get the business done, this month Raid have just released a jumbo new feature, Awakening. And a brutal new dungeon, the Iron Twins Fortress. If you can hack it, you'll receive a huge payoff, being able to awaken your champions. Your champion receives a huge blessing, transforming how they perform in battle. And here's the big one. Raid have just dropped a super-powered, legendary version of the people's champion, Death Knight. He's beefy, he's ripe, he's ready for absolute carnage, mate. And the best part about this absolute hunk is that he comes free. All you have to do is log in and play for seven days between now on October 27th. And Ultimate Death Knight is within your collection. The time to get started is now. You can also use the code DKRISES for free items to instantly level your new strongest champion to level 50, 5 star ascension. If you've not played, click the link in the description or scan the QR code here on screen to get unique bonuses worth $30. Includes a free epic champion, Tyrell, 200,000 silver, 1 energy refill and 1 XP boost and 1 ancient shard. So you can summon absolute weapon champions as soon as you start playing. And speaking of absolute weapons, this is going to be them in their prime tryhard formations. Currently, there's 28 Elite Four members. Just in time for there to be 32 in about a month. I mean, who knows what train as a system they'll use, though. Everyone was fuming enough Gala just reused the gym leaders instead of the traditional Elite Four setup. But I don't care about that. I'm ranking the current known Elite Four members. A high-ranking member of a region's evil organization being one of the Elite Four is a banger idea to go on. It's just a shame that that member at best is an assistant regional manager of Team Flair. Couldn't even stop you walking into a casino, let alone stopping you making it to the champion. Yeah, Chandelure's a banger, but don't let that literally gaslight you into thinking she's anything but a Team Flair pencil pusher. I mean, Talon Flame's solid. It's a safe pick and makes sense for Kalos. But those two and that portable kitchen hob she throws at you, they're not going to carry all of that dead pyro weight. Kalos doesn't have too many fire types to make it that much more salvageable for her. She could have added Houndoom, Heatmore, Makargo, but even then, you'd still be looking at one of the most dead Elite Four trainers going. Only four slots. You've got to make them spaces count. Go get yourself a Blaziken with that speed boost, and then you'd be justifying that singular entity taking up your entire left pocket. In Torkoal, he's there to what exactly? Got set up Pyro to be all paprika up, ripe and ready for a quick round one sparking out by getting a belly rub from eight ounce gloves don't even need to put the gloves on you can take it down with a firm enough handshake you know what i don't even know why i'm bothering to go on about this really her tall cold can't even spawn her up a son so it's just there to curse you crack your floorboards and keep your pot noodle warm seabold seabold but he's predictably gonna have to come next. You know, it's okay having four Pokemon. It's alright, even your Nova did it. But if you're gonna do that, then you have to throw in a rematch with the full fat. You know what I mean? You can't leave us thinking that the top guys, well, they've never caught more than four in their entire careers. Really telling me a world-class trainer doesn't even know what a PC is. I'm starting to think the Kalos Elite Four aren't even aware that the other three of them exist. A reading comprehension ain't the strong suit of Kalos. They all read the job application thinking their Pokemon are the Elite Four. Claw 
Lancer, Gyarados, Starmie, and Barbaracle. It's a shame because the blueprint is there for a solid team, actually. It's just not going to compete with anyone else when that pint is one third empty. In Kalos, that means he could have also had Crawdon, Cloyster, Kingdra, Politoed, Slowbro. Handily, he could have been a fairly competent water trainer, as well as the world famous chef he claims to be. The most common Pokemon type going. It's not like the roster is too slim for him to catch two more. Doesn't even need a Pokeball. Get yourself a Super Rod and you're set. I'm starting to think it's not even up to him how many Pokemon he wants. I can't blame him now that only four of them are willing to be on his team. With your man here, water types can't tell whether they're going in the Ultra Ball or the Deep Fat Fryer. <laughs> gonna have to give the first non-Frenchman dead ranking to Olivia because I can't give Olivia much else but at least she has her pockets full but you know even six Pokemon is a bit low for the kind of team she has specializing in the rock type that should mean you get like diplomatic immunity to the six balls at a time law like a badge you can bring along that lets you park in the disabled spot should get at least two extra slots to make things a bit fair rock is already putting you low for its weaknesses but even then how many rock types are that great to begin Begin with. Outside of legendaries and mega forms, especially, let me tell you the hierarchy of rock types, okay? You have Tyranitar and the rest. You're not selling yourself as a top level trainer when within the entire type you specialize in, there's only like one genetic jackhammer and you're nowhere near even getting a hold of it. A top five trainer of rock types needs at least Agron, but even Rhyperia to even have me pretend to believe that Olivia and those six rocks she has in her pocket are of any threat to me. You know, I'd say another predictable one, but really forgot Drasna existed. You'd think she would stand out because she's the one dragon trainer who poses zero threats. Looks like she got a hold of the Drake Reserve Squad, the Lance Hand-Me-Downs. Looks to be like a 50-year age gap between her and Iris, but based on these teams, it's looking more like Iris is the older cousin who happened to give her all the trading cards she had doubles of. Inexcusable that your dragon trainer in Kalos hasn't even got the time to train up a Gudra. How, how are you even going to call yourself the premier dragon trainer of Kalos without having a Gumi well Welded to your head like a brain slug the moment you reached age 10. You know what? That's not even good enough. It should have been raised into at minimum sligu before you even blow them candles out on your birthday cake. You know what? You, you shouldn't even get a birthday cake. Gumi is your cake. Oh, you did my favorite. Hmm. Slime membrane. The anthem must have pulled some backstage politics behind the scene to make sure she's the only one strapped with the Gudra, avoiding a potential bit of gimmick infringement. Hmm. Slime's kind of my thing, brother. Doesn't work for me. Every dragon going is walking the mean streets of Kalos, apparently. You know, she thinks she would have got the digits for at least one. At least one of the biggins. It's a whole team of the silver or even bronze medal dragons of each region. Look, Alola, I get it's your first crack at having an Elite Four, but it just isn't up to that standard. Olivia was one thing, and you can at least give her a pass for using only Pokemon that could be made extinct by Politoed's mere presence. Then you go and throw us Haller as well. He's okay, but it definitely felt like the Alola region was lacking for the talent, didn't have the manpower to make a challenging Elite Four. They were just reaching for anyone who knew how to throw a Pokeball straight. Like you ask some of your friends and family, like, Oi, you, you know anyone who's good with cars? Ah, oh. My, my, my granddad's not bad with motors. I'll, I'll give him a call. I'll, I'll see if he can sort anything. Compared to the other fighting type Elite Four trainers, half of Haller's team may as well be a horde of normal types who do boxer size two nights a week. Evolving King Crabrawler alone makes him a complete bogan. But the rest of his Pokemon, Primate, Hariyama, Polyrath, Beware, Machamp, ah, uh, yeah, it'll do. It'll do. Acerola, at least that's what I think you called. You're definitely not called Ace Roller. Haven't got a single ace on the squad. The least spooky ghost alliance I've ever seen in my life. SpongeBob at the Halloween party was more intimidating than any creature she owns. And I'm talking before the white sheet gets taken off of him. Your front man gets done in with a plastic spade. Your staple Pokemon would get 1v1'd in a sandbox by Tommy Pickles. Acerola seems more like a seventh gym badge kind of battle. The other type is collectively tanked up as the ghosts. And when you rock up with this, you can't help but imagine aside from the Alolan ones, the rest just seem a bit randomized. So many of her choices are like every other ghost trainer's fourth choice. The droughts of Hoenn are long over. You don't need to be using the Sableyes and Burnettes because there's barely anything else to use. There's a 
whole world out there of spooky ghosts to solve mysteries about while eating comically large sandwiches to catch. I didn't think a group of specimens bordering on the line of reality and afterlife could be this collectively like a pack of Coke Zero mid. An Elite Four trainer, they have no business being stuck with a ghost team that could be swept by a wound up pair of teeth. Wickstrom is the one Kalos trainer who gets away with the concept of less is more here because Scizor and definitely Aegislash can pull the weight of a smaller team. May only have four, but really, Aegislash alone is worth more than half a Steven Stone's team and he's seen as the scariest man to ever lace a pair of boots in the entire Hoenn region. That's like if Malva actually had a speed boost Blaziken. Wickstrom's definitely lined his left pocket up nicely. Your man probably keeps the ball for Aegislash on his left hip and a sheath. Goes about day to day LARPing like he has a family full of nonces to protect. You know he's gotta have that strap on him. With the Kalos catalogue that's available to him, he's legit only two Pokemon off being an elite Elite Four trainer. I wouldn't blame him for being in the full kit at all times with the steel weapons he could have been the caretaker of. Cause if Wickstrom brought his full belt to work on that day you went to face the Kalos League, those last two slots potentially could have been Magnazone, Bishop, Therathorn, Luke Cario. Ooh, what a half chubbed weapon Wickstrom is. Glacial went from having one of the most slim teams going. I think back in 2002, I think, think the freezer broke on her. Half of her team must exist in gas form. Her team almost had me thinking Hoenn's Elite Four had an intermission halfway through for some ice cold bevies and a light bit of entertainment. Cause the freezer was looking dreadful when she only had a hold of two different species. Gen 6 came along and just reset the whole thing for her. You have Walrein still, but now you've got Mega Glalie, Vanillix, Frostless Bertic and a Bomber Snow. It's an okay team. Before it was just room temperature, a humid, room temperature and all. It's nice and chilled now. The first ever Elite Four member you beef with is only fitting because Lorelei is the perfect gateway trainer into the Pokemon League. Ice is just asking to be challenge number one. A good little sparring sesh to loosen up your pocket pals before the real fights kick off later. You know, always safer to do your stretches before getting into a physical conflict with a man who has the terrifying amount of confidence to wear a cape on the daily. Like, come on now. In Gen 1 especially, that Lapras might make you look like a prime time player, but you lead with Dugon, a horn away from being scientifically downgraded into a normal creature. But then she's got a Cloyster, Jinx, Slowbro, and recently a Lowland Sandslash. She's a good mix, all right, of coming across as powerful and a big deal of a trainer, while also having a very slappable team. Aaron had arguably one of the worst Elite Four teams when you first run into him. But thanks to remakes, you can see how he's cleaned his act up a little bit. Half his team doesn't look like it was made by leaving his bedroom window open a little in the summer. Although, fair enough, his actual method isn't much better to be honest. Most of these he got a hold of by slavering honey to a tree in his back garden. Difficult to think your team's cracking the top four of your country when they all have the same spawn rate as Winnie the Pooh. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Heracross can put away a mean specimen in a scrap as well as a mean tub of honey. Then he's got Drapion, Scissor, Yanmega, Vesper Queen. Sure, they even chuck him a Flygon now. At his worst, his team could be done in with a comically large net. But when he's polished up his pockets, all right, he can handle himself a bit more. It's not too bad. Koga is a prime example of a trainer where I'd be interested in Elite Four trainers being based on concepts instead of just types. Being a ninja, the poison type makes sense, but an all-around assassin themed team, that'd be far more interesting for Elite Fours to do. His team's already set in Gen 4, except uh, except, except me man Swallow. Hey Swallow, nah he can go back in catering while the real assassins go out and do the business. Cause Swallow's just a less efficient muck even down to the biology of the two. Swallow needs a huge malleable mouth to consume. You know what muck needs to consume? Physical contact. A sentient physical malware. Once you've established that contact, your only option is to reformat your life. So Beta Muck, he can get thrown off in exchange for the fortress that he somehow willingly cut from his team. His team's looking like those two, Crobat, Toxicroak, Skuntag, likely Weezing too, but he can't seem to get enough without Venom off, can he? Arguably his weakest, but somehow one of his most iconic. If Koga's going to Pizza Planet and his mum's saying, hey, you can bring one toy, then it's going to be Venom off and Muck who are going to be chosen by the claw later that night. 
Will was never getting too far when two of his five Pokemon were Zartu. It's as if he got one Zartu so he could look into the future for him, but he kept seeing himself get swept by every trainer within his eyesight. So he got another Zartu to try and re-roll his odds. You know what I mean? Your man's shaking the magic eight ball again because he wasn't keen on the first answer it gave him. Thankfully, the second Zartu saw into the future to Gen 4, where it also happened to get a preview of being handed his own pink slip. Consider it lucky Will even chose to keep one of you, let alone the pair. Must have future sighted its way into getting some dirt on Will to make the draft for his psychic team because he gets that Sinnoh being discovered content buff, but still remains a moderately dead trainer as far as psychic trainers go at least. There's no excuses when you have a catalogue as thick as the psychic types. He made an attempt though. You can't really deny his choice to swallow up the team with Bronzong and Gardevoir, but I reckon the team stays the same from there with Executor Slowbro Jinx and is somehow irreplaceable frontman Zartu. <laughs> The only Elite Four flying type specialist, you know, other than what the people could only dub Bird Keeper Lance. All right, we know. But I don't blame there not being many flying specialists around. It's a bit limited in the same way that Rock is here, and you specialize in a secondary type effectively. The whole basis of you as a trainer is an add on. Your vocation in life is everything wing related birds, planes. Nando's, Luchadors, Boots Off Ground, Big Floaty Mons, Slapping Air. And that seems to work out in Kahili's favor here, since she arguably has one of the most mixed Elite Four teams going. Because her team is more like Fire, Steel, Poison, Dark Fighting, featuring the Flying Tight. Specimens of a wide palette. The entry requirements are simple. If you can float, you're in. If you can sort out the big shop without touching the ground, you've made the draft, my man. Skarmory, Crobat, Halucha, Braviary, Mandibuzz, Oricorio, Sokahili, surprisingly buff Pokemon for a lower of standards. <laughs> Sydney's always been someone who you can easily throttle. I guess he became self-aware with his tendency to be throttled with ease, and ever since 2014, he's got a hold of Scrafty, Zoroark, Mandibuzz, Mega Absol, Crawdont, and Shift 3 would probably have to take the last two slots if I were him. Noticing a correlation with the Hoenn trainers. They're all like third place compared to every other region for the type they specialize in. Sydney's second to every dark trainer going. Phoebe's only above Acerolas, saying nothing. Glacius below Lorelei and ooh, oh, this one stings. Drake, my main man, but he's a bronze medal dragon trainer compared to Lance and Iris. Triple S tier lab though. No, that's where it matters really. He's off season. He's out of his prime. Like your man Whitebeard, world's strongest man, but his errors come to a close. Yeah, that'll be my coat. But I can't let that make Sydney seem like a complete sideman here. Even though he's by far the worst dark trainer here, his team still has a good amount of spice going for it. One of the things making Flint more of a standout Elite Four trainer is how mixed his team manages to be. But it's like I said about Koga, gym leaders being type only is fine, but Elite Four trainers being based around entire gimmicks would make them that much more prestigious and interesting to come up against. Flint has a wide variety stashed away since he seems to be based around fire itself and not just the type. I get the Flint and Steelix, and Driftblim makes sense being gas. Lopany, I... Uh, that's uh, Lopany, the only one with a lighter. I know as a fire type trainer, right? He needs to go for Pokemon that are generally hot. I guess his definition of that word is on a far bigger spectrum than your average trainer, since it's looking like he's been taking a heavy dosage of the Lola bunny pill. Flint may be the only trainer where I'd say remakes don't really improve his selections too much. The classics were fine the way they were. I'd say you hang on to the Steelix and Driftblim, along with Infernape, Houndoom, Magmortar, and Arcanine's a good shout too. Phoebe gets a much needed trip to the cemetery or two. Might look a bit dodgy going about the morgue armed like bug catcher Doug, but high risk, high reward. Gotta catch them all ain't just a catchphrase to giga drain your parents' bank accounts. It's take no prisoner. <laughs> going through all that effort to catch some ghosts to be a member of the four, you better have banger after banger after banger for your team. So Phoebe's team ever since Gen 6 has banger after banger after banger featuring 
the rest. But her team's pretty solid. She hasn't copped herself a full six pack of that Coke Zero. She's at least got the full fat and got a hold of some premium tinnies. Them tropical Rios of the squad. Phoebe has the potential there to be a proper elite trainer. All she really needs is that one last big un thrown onto her team. But you can't help but think that she's stunted her growth a bit by being attached to the homegrown talent, having to hang about with them Hoenn ghosts. All you're doing is holding yourself back by not having more of the prime time selections. Sableye got salvaged by the Mega, Dusclops, kinda? Got improved by evolving? Fair play with those two. But if you replace Burnett with like a Gengar, even a Frostless would take care of business. Chandelure's a good start now, but you could at least utilize the transfer season a bit more efficiently. Begin negotiation talks for a Haunter trade. Everyone loves to grill Bruno for having his two onyx. Valid grill, not the most threatening Irish handles to be up against. Doesn't exactly convey to you a man who looks as hard as this now, does it? Wiggly snakes akimbo, Terra Onyx on hand, and for what? Convinced he's only got him there because Hitmonchan needs a few cans to inflate his boxing record. Red and blue would have you thinking Bruno is Pokemon's biggest overachiever. The guy fell upwards to the top four with two heavy bags and a trio of fitness first managers. The only way he's ever made it to be a top trainer in any region is if he is the sixth Pokemon. Those two Onyx are just there to loosen you up for Bruno to step in and tune you up personally. Pokemon League definitely hired him from looks alone. And who could blame him? No man who looks like he spars with boulders could be that weak, surely. But the game's changed. Bruno's now made more than enough appearances to show up to work as if he didn't lie on the CV. He's the only one who's still there when Johto comes about, so he must have been doing something right to adapt. He might have an Onyx, but once he's got some friends and a nice bit of iron clobber for him to wear for that trade evolution, Steelix is a lot more suitable for the Elite Four standard, which I can only assume is on a fighting team, so the rest of them have some iron to weightlift with. If you take his worst Pokemon, yeah, he's just got a few gym lads. With a pair of ropes to swing about. With six different versions of them though. Lucario, Machamp, Steelix, Poliwrath, Alolan Golem, Hitmonlee, Hitmonchan. He's definitely as solid as his areolas make him out to be. If Bruno were a recess character, first of all, he's gonna have to get to the back of the line, all right? Miss Finster is mine. Marshall, he would be the Bruno doppelganger who goes to the other school. They both have Lucario. Instead of the Hitmon pair, you've got Sork and Throw. Instead of Conkelda, you've got Machamp as well as Machamp. So this was a tough decision, splitting between the two vascular, juiced up, Sonic movie looking hairs between Bruno and Marshall. The similarities negate each other enough, so the difference maker really is Honkelda, Breloom, Mineshaw, and Toxicroak. It's subjective if you think having a mixed team makes Bruno superior, but I'm gonna have to give the win to Marshall here, purely because his team is the better fighting type team. Talking pure fighting, yeah, Marshall has to win. How could he not when his team is what happens if you ask Joe Rogan to be a gym leader. And looking at this team, along with the lethal side B he throws with them powerful, literally five foot three legs, a badge gym leader Rogan's given out is probably that disabled parking one I mentioned earlier. The Bruno double onyx curse of Kanto having a slim Pokedex for some type specialists. That applies to Agatha as well. But two Gengars. She is not frothing at the mouth for the Johto region to save her team like Bruno was. Doubling down on one of the most overpowered specimens of his time. You know, she's, she's got time. She's chilling. No, no, no rush, boss. No rush. Ah, no rush. Introducing that dark type just yet. And safe splitting that special stat for now for a bit. You know, let her enjoy being cozy and overpowered for a while. Dual Gengars, Mischievous, Crobat, Weezing, and Alolan Marowak. She's still got her Arbok about to somewhere, but like, let's be real here. Anyone's sticking with the two Gengars. You have a Pokeball in each hand. Unlike Bruno, that's a worthy bit of a Kimbo slice. It's a good thing she polished up her selection there though. You take out the good half of her Pokemon and the rest of them would barely stop your walking into Silphco. The Alola region, far too cozy, a bit too holiday-like, making his trainers a bit too soft. Too busy cowabungering about, drinking mimosas on a villa, while you're out session on the beach eating frozen bananas, you know they had entire cities frozen to death. It's no wonder their trainers always have that strap on them, permanent on-site mentality. The biggest struggle most Alolans face is going to the beach and forgetting to pack the aftersun. So it's about time we find ourselves 
ourselves a competent trainer to spawn out of Pokemon's Benidorm. Because Malane's got that, right? It's the sequel game, let's give them a bit of a squeeze kind of team. Metagross, Bishop, Magnazone, Ooh, Klefki, Alolan, Sandslash, and Dugtrio. A steel specialist like that is about one plane ticket away from overthrowing the Hoenn region. My personal favourite member of any Elite Four, of course, the main man Drake. Say what you want about Lance having better Pokemon. Alright, whatever, it is what it is. Take it to the streets or the long hard voyages on that ocean. Take the Pokeballs out of your pocket right now. Put them on the desk, leave them over there. Take the gloves off. Let's see how well that's gonna work out for him. If Lance ever tried to disrespect Drake, your man better hope that cape lets him fly. So once again, Drake is primed and ready for a pirate themed set of mons without even making his team weaker necessarily could still have Salamence, Dragalgi, Kingdra, even say Haxorus could easily fit on a pirate team. But seriously, look at this guy and tell me how he doesn't own a Crawdon. I'd be having him set sail to Gala and get a hold of Grappolot, his own personal cracking in a ball, having rival ships in a DAS choke with two tentacles, Grog held and consumed with the other two. Either way, being pure dragon still makes him the absolute weapon he fronts as. Mega Salamence, Dragalgi, Kingdra, along with Haxorus, Flygon, and Altaria. The undercard of his lineup is still solid, but I have to shed all my bias here to acknowledge that he's definitely a bit second rate compared to Iris or Lance. You really can't go wrong with a psychic team because you'd assume a trainer who specializes in brain power would have had the mental capacity to look into team building. At minimum, consult his local professor because there's no excuse not being A tier minimum with psychic types. Lucian on the other brain actually has the mind to match the muscle here. His brain wasn't smooth enough to completely air the plentiful selection the psychic type has to offer when forming an alliance of mind-numbing weapons. If you've got a psychic type team unarmed to handle a bowl of soup, you've already lost me. Alakazam pre-built on any mentally harming team. It took Lucian a while to smarten up with his choices. Somehow he had a team that was underwhelming when you first face him. But overall, he's calm. He gets by these days. Alakazam, Bronzong, Espeon, Slowbro, Gallade, and Medicham, worthy of the upper bracket. Back when I made what I thought at the time would be the best Elite Four within a worldwide Pokemon League, Karen was one of the top dons. I think at the time I didn't want any two trainers from the same region, and Unova was already taking up a space, so Karen was the best Dark as well as Johto choice. Although I've had to refine my overall top four in this video here, that doesn't mean she's no longer one of the most elite of all the fours. You can't argue against a set of mons like Gengar, Honchkrow, Weevil, Spiritomb, Umbra, on. And you know she's gotta have the Houndoom. She's not your standard Karen, alright? You know, none of that making a scene in the middle of Mackie's because they won't accept her expired Monopoly reward for six chicken nuggets. Doubt she even has kids, or ever would. Probably hates babies. I mean, her favorite Pokemon's Houndoom. The Kingpin of the Afterlife. The Phenom, the Undertaker. Now, Chantel doesn't need the handles gripped around a pair of Gengar like Agatha. The future's now, old man. Don't need, like, three of the same Pokemon anymore, like your World War II ration teams only needs the singular Gengar to leave a slot free to have all the ghostly weapons. Crawfogrigus, Chandelure, Golurk, Jellison, Miss Mages, Frostless, Driftblim. You're not star for options here. This one's no Acerola botch job. This team is as scary as SpongeBob at the Krusty Krab Halloween party. And I mean after giving everyone brain. Let's just get this one out of the way now. Oh look, there he is, there he is. The great Homelancer. Homelancer over here has the advantage of being a champion and appearing in half the games. So his PC has all the firepower to match the cape. The full PC for the full kit. I can't live in denial that my man Drake is getting slightly outworked here. But come now, Drake never had a chance of being the strongest trainer. Being neck and neck with Lance, there's no shame there for Drake. Because as overrated as he seems, you can't 
deny that Lance is still one of the front men of the Elite Four. Even with his pre-champion pocket men, Dragonite, Gyarados, Aerodactyl, Kingdra, Mega Charizard X, even gets the Alolan Executor. We all know the shade thrown at him, Bird Keeper Lance and all that, but his Elite Four teams are collectively very mixed compared to your average type specialist. So not only is he a unit, he's got types of all variety, so he's a bit more difficult to take out. Bertha is a bit of a sleeper banger here. As a ground specialist and all, obviously a pure rock type team is such a bad hand to be trying to deal with. I never thought the solution would be so easy. All you have to do is weld all of that rock straight into the ground. That way you can be like Bertha and have yourself an absolute steel toe cap of a team. Gliscor, Mamoswine, Hippodon, Nidoking, Quagsire and Rhyperior. Because that's actually pound for pound such an elite lineup. And trust me, boys, there's plenty of pounds to go around. Except, except you, Nido King. Even Quagsire's got 30 pounds on you. I don't want to hear any water weight excuse. Quagsire is pure muscle, right down to the dome. Patriarch of the Nido clan is still a growing boy, apparently. Short King coming in at the exact height as Quagsire. Nature be a cruel mistress. Look at that body to mouth ratio. Nido King's taking the family down the bomb shelter when Quagsire visits the same route because they both know two gulps minimum and Nido King's straight in that belly. But that's what we like about Bertha. She's all about the big meaty mons but doesn't discriminate our short kings because it's never been about the height of the meat. It's always been about the fight of the meat. <laughs> The dark trainer for my top four somehow isn't Karen. She can take it up with the manager of the Pokemon League all she wants. Not gonna change the fact she's definitely getting outworked by your man Grimsley. Both are readily armed to sort out any baby Pokemon with a Houndoom on hand. And Houndoom's one of my favorite all-time Pokemon, but I couldn't argue against it sitting on the bench here. Hard to argue against Tyranitar, Bishop, Crocodile, Scrafty, Honchkrow, and Drapion. Every other Elite Four member has some filler choices to warm you up, to ease you into the fight. You can't be going straight into the Salamence, all right? Gotta give you a fighting chance. Drake will throw you, he'll throw you a Shell Gun or two, you know? women and children first. But Grimsley has specifically tailored his team to crush the dreams of children. The parents must love him. He's doing the good deed, sending your children packing home. To finally get him over this little Pokemon phase. You know, it's not, there's no money to be made in it, all right? You're graduating school and become an accountant. Look, I, I don't know the man. I have no clue what it is, but I know for a fact this guy has a motive. A team like that isn't playing around. Straight to business. The rest of the Elite Four are guarding the champion. Grimsley's fighting like the champion's room is where he keeps his My Little Pony jar collection he's been topping up since 2011. <laughs> You know how there's levels to this? When it comes to psychic trainers, Will's team would give you a mean bit of brain freeze. Lucian's, a New Year's hangover. Ooh, a bit, ooh, a bit, oh, a bit rough. Caitlyn's would have your brain looking like Chris Benoit's. She possesses the biggest brain over not just the psychic trainers, but arguably over all of the Elite Fours. Could visualize an unsolved Rubik's Cube in her head and solve it through pure imagination. Every psychic trainer should at least have enough intellect to know their teams come pre-built with Alakazam. It doesn't take a hedgehog despising IQ to know Metagross makes that short list as well. Caitlyn's the only one who's managed to double up with the non-negotiable psychic type selections. It's difficult to choose the other four exactly because there's a fine buffet of moist wrinkled brain specimens to choose from. Gallade, Bronzong, Reuniclus, Sigilyph, Mashana, Gothitelle, but all in all, Caitlyn would have to be the elite of the elite. <laughs>